Okay, good morning, everyone. Now everyone can definitely hear me. Uh, let's see if I can, okay, here we go. Okay, yeah, so uh, Finality Gadget will be, uh, okay, yeah, so the Finality Gadget, some research we've been looking into to use uh, the beacon chain from ETH 2.0 to enhance the security of the ETH 1 chain. Uh, so here I will explain what it is. You might have heard of it in like a lot of different contexts, so we'll just kind of go through it. Uh, I'll try and show you why we want it. Hopefully there's like some fun reasons. Uh, then we'll talk quickly about how we get it. Uh, and yeah, then we'll wrap up by seeing how you can help. So yeah, this is like super high level TLDR. Like, like I said, using the proof of stake beacon chain from ETH 2.0 to uh, enhance the security of the proof of work chain we have today. So you're like, well, what's going on? There's <laughs> now there's more blockchains. Like, how does this work? Uh, here's this little picture. So again, because this is going to like couple these two systems together, uh, there's like a lot going on. So I try to be clear. Like, there's this 1.0 blockchain, right? So this is like the proof of work chain we have. There's the 2.0 beacon chain, and I'll explain a little bit more what that is exactly. And then this will become clear later. But essentially, uh, this this is like. Uh, showing finality extending from the 2.0 chain to the 1.0 chain. We'll go into a lot more detail on that. So I'm sure you've seen this like a thousand times by this point. Very briefly, we'll break down ETH 2.0. Uh, there's a beacon chain. It's a proof of stake blockchain, completely new chain from the existing one. And uh, it's going to build out this new sharded system that we'll have very soon. Uh, the way we do that is. We have this beacon chain, which is like sort of the system chain. It operates and manages validators in the system. Then from there, we have all these shard chains, which are all these little circles. Let's say there's like a thousand of them. That's where user level transactions will happen. And ultimately, we'll have phase two. Then we have like all of the fun dApps we know and love on these shard chains. Hopefully with like much, great, much greater scalability. So yeah, then the question is always, OK, this is great. You might have noticed I keep saying phase phase 0, phase 1, phase 2. Because the system's so complicated, we're like breaking this out into phases. It'll just easier to get right to have like discrete chunks. We can kind of go and deploy one at a time. Uh, then of course, everyone's like, OK, well, when is this happening? The short answer is like when it's ready. Uh, we don't want to like rush anything. And there's a lot to get right, and there's a lot to get wrong. So in the meantime, you can ask, OK, what about the chain we have today? And we have this whole bundle of initiatives to Ethereum called Ethereum 1X. Again, you've also probably heard a lot about this over the past couple of days. Uh, it's a like bundle of features to improve the Ethereum we have today, keep it going. Uh, so like Alexei has been looking at state management and like state growth on the chain and like deploying some sort of state fees to help with the growth there. Updates to the VM. So this, would, for example, would be like um, deploying EWAS and precompiles to accelerate certain parts of computation on chain. Protocol economics, you probably heard of EIP 1559, which is changing how transaction fee markets work so that they're less volatile on things. And then finally, another one of these is the finality gadget, which we'll look at now. Uh, OK, quick diversion. Uh, we're going to talk about the finality gadget for the rest of the talk. But I just want to take a moment to like communicate that uh, we can actually get tangible value out of each phase of this ETH2 deployment. Uh, with phase zero, we can do the finale gadget, which we'll look at soon. With phase one, we can actually think about using the shard chains as this like data layer for the existing chain. And that lets us do cool things like plasma, ZK rollups, ZK, ZK rollups, which is an idea Vitalik had. Anyways, all these like cool layer two scaling ideas that we can uh, leverage these shard data chains for once they're deployed. Uh, then finally, phase two. Uh, again, there are a lot of ideas around how to like move ETH1 into ETH2. And uh, yeah, the main, point, the main takeaway here is that you know, it's, it's not that this, all this cool stuff is like far many years away. Uh, with each step of this deployment, we can like get something really cool on Ethereum today. OK, so back to the finality gadget. Uh, like I said, we're going to have the 2.0 chain. There's this process of the consensus on the beacon chain called Casper. Uh, part of Casper is finality. 
and finality are essentially a set of rules that say once validators in the system have made so many statements of a certain form, uh, basically you, you can't like fork the blockchain from what we'll call a finalized block without burning like a ton of the validator's bonds. And that's how you keep the system secure. So like in theory, you could like make these bonds arbitrarily high, so you get arbitrarily high security. We then want to say, okay, let's use the security on the, the proof of work chain, finality edit. So like breaking it down, there's like two key pieces or like mechanisms, right? So we'll call it the finality engine, which is like how we get this finality in the first place. Then, uh, hopefully I made it clear, like these systems are like very uncoupled. And so, uh, you know, finality is happening here. And unless this part learns about this part, then there's no way to finalize this stuff. It's like whatever's up here could be finalized and then it's just like kind of floating out in space. We need, a, we need a way to learn about the ETH1 chain. That's why I'm mean over here by ETH1 data. So the first bit uh, is the finality engine. Uh, so we'll quickly go through this finality thing. Again, here's a blockchain. Uh, doesn't really matter which one, proof of stake blockchain. You know, blocks, blocks have links to their previous block. So the idea here is that these arrows are indicating that uh, the proof of stake validators in this system are like making these, these messages, these attestations, is a term you may have heard. Uh, they're like, yeah, I think like this is the next block in the chain. And uh, that's kind of one of their main duties in life as a validator is to like make these messages because as we'll see in a second, we can kind of look at these messages and figure out uh, if we hit our like security thresholds or not. So the, the next bit of finality is this process called justification. And these are these thresholds I was just talking about. Uh, so what we're gonna say is that, you know, let's say there's like, you know, a group of validators. If two thirds of them all make an attestation or this, you know, this claim that this next block is in the main chain, uh, and if two thirds of them do that, then we're going to say that it's justified. And that's why I'm indicating here by this gold arrow. Uh, you see down here, this one's still blue. So like maybe we're at the head of the chain and validators are working on it, but not everyone has like made their attestation yet, right? So we're not quite there. Uh, something also to note is that you can actually like, you know, skip blocks here. So like this would actually suggest there, there are no messages made, no attestations. And that's okay, you can just keep going as you see. Now we get to the fun part, finality. Uh, there's like this very special rule that you just have to learn and basically it's, uh, the rule is if I justify on top of something justified, then this first one's finalized. And this is just the pattern that you have to like apply and uh, I'll show you in a second how we get security out of this. But essentially, you know, so we can say, okay, justification on top of this one, this is finalized, uh, justification. So the thing is, uh, it's not just justification sort of in sequence, but like direct sequence, meaning this, this block is not finalized because uh, there was not like a direct descendant of this that was justified. Then we see down here, we like skip some blocks, maybe there's like just some weird network latency, right? And uh, then we keep going, so then, this block was justified from back here. Uh, we justified directly on top of it, so this one's actually finalized. And then we have the situation where like, we're trying to build finality on the head of the chain down here. Now we get to the bit where the security comes in. You've probably heard of these slashing conditions. And these are rules that basically enforce uh, really this here. Uh, what it's saying is that as long as some like conditions hold in terms of like these patterns of justifications and votings, you can't finalize two conflicting blocks. So let's, let's say there's a fork here, right? These blocks are at the same height. You can't finalize two conflicting blocks without either, uh, well really without at least a third of the validators losing their stake. So that's what I'm trying to show over here. We like burned a third of the ETH that was validating, not good. Uh, and we can actually prove this. There have been mat like mathematical proofs. There's work in sort of formal ver verification of these systems. All this good stuff. 
And really, yeah, just like sketch the intuition here, like as long as we haven't had one of these attacks, we haven't, you know, had one of these events where all these validators were slash, then uh, we have sort of one single history. And like here we see this is like what's supposed to happen. Even if there was a fork sort of broadcast on the network, uh, what still happens is that, you know, two thirds majority of the validators went down this fork. They did not go down this fork. And so as long as you know who the validators are, you can actually determine this based on the messages on the network and figure out the true chain. And to give you some sense, uh, a healthy amount of ETH that might be validating an ETH 2.0 is say 10 million. So then for one of these attacks to be successful, right, that's uh, a third of the ETH has been burned, 3.3 million. Based on numbers yesterday, that's over $630 million. Uh, and this is sort of per attack, so quite expensive. Okay, that was a very compressed uh, explanation of finality. We'll now talk about how the beacon chain learns about ETH1 data, and then what we're gonna do is as we finalize the beacon chain, which learns about this ETH1 data, we'll end up finalizing the ETH1 chain. Hopefully that's clear. <laughs> um, so how this works in practice is that We'll deploy this beacon chain. There'll also be what's called the deposit contract. And with this deposit contract, the idea is that anyone can then make a deposit of ETH to this smart contract on the ETH1 chain. The ETH2 chain is then essentially a light client of this contract and is watching this contract. Uh, and that's how validators enter the system. So, you know, it's sort of trustless in this way. You don't have to like go to ethereum.org and like sign up to be a validator. Uh, anyone can sort of permissionlessly join the system. Um, yeah, and then as, as a key part of this, any validator in the new system then to, for example, make a valid beacon block has to include uh, sort of their latest view of the ETH1 chain, and that's how you get this like client functionality. So here are some diagrams to that effect. Basically what I want to show is like there's a proof of work chain, right, up here, beacon chain is up here, the system's operational, it's going and all this, basically in some block. Uh, we have some data, right? So like this block has a block hash. Uh, there's like an address to this deposit contract. There's a root of all said deposits that have been made to become a validator. And then essentially to enter into the validator set here, you can make proofs against this, right? So I've already claimed that we're essentially a light client of this contract. What that means then is that we know sort of this special root in the contract. We can, in the usual way, make Merkle proofs to figure out, okay, was this deposit included or not? That's what that says. Uh, great, so. Yeah, so then, really this ties it all together. Uh, I'm just gonna kind of keep moving so we can ask questions at the end, hopefully. I realize this is a lot quickly. Uh, but basically, what we then have, right, is Beacon chain learns about ETH1 blocks. As we finalize the beacon chain, we implicitly finalize these ETH1 blocks, right? So for example, it's like, you know, by this block, we said, hey, the head of the ETH1 chain was this block. Then as we finalize this beacon block, because essentially, you know, this block cache is written here and it's finalized, we know that via reference, this is now finalized. And then because of the chain nature, anything before it is finalized. So then we'll like, keep increasing suffixes of this chain as we finalize more and more beacon blocks. And then just to you know, belabor the point, what that then means is that you'd have to have one of these huge burnings of all this validating ETH to actually have, for example, a reversion on the 1.0 chain. Okay, yeah, why do we want it? Um, essentially, again, I'm trying to make this argument for better security. Uh, there's this quote I've usually heard attributed to Vlad, which is like, with the proof of stake attack, it says if your ASIC farm burned down with every attack. And what this means is that, you know, let's say we're on the proof of work chain. If I want to attack you, I just have to get like a bunch of hardware, right? And I just like throw all this hash power at your chain. And then suddenly there's like a competing fork. Uh, the only way to really like stop you, if I don't know where you are, is uh, to, change our proof of work, right? Which we know can be tricky. 
So <laughs> uh, with proof of stake, you can actually, because you have this like reference in the protocol, this like representation in the protocol of this like consensus object, you can basically just say, hey, we're gonna like coordinate as a community to say, delete this part that's attacking us, and you can just keep doing this, you know, as you need. Um, I'm gonna short on time, so I'm gonna speed through some of this bit. Um, again, security, security, security. This is another one people are really into, is that we can actually reduce issuance, right, because with the security of the beacon chain leverage to the ETH1 chain, we actually don't need to like, uh, we don't need as high a mining subsidy. And yeah, take away ETH1 loves ETH2. We can like do a lot of cool stuff way before we have this like nice shiny, uh, awesome like future execution environment system. Um, and again, a lot could go wrong. It's coupling these two systems in like a very uh, intimate way. And so we definitely need a lot of like research into like what could go wrong and how before we like kind of move ahead. So that's about where we are now. Uh, we had like, there's a working group. We had like our first call some time ago. There's this link here. I'll share this on the internet later. Uh, a current kind of open question is that a lot of the beacon chain light client infrastructure has kind of been delayed to phase one. So that may like defer when and how we can do stuff here. Uh, again, there's like active research into that at the moment. Uh, here's the link to the working group on ETH Magicians. There's a Telegram group. And I want to get to questions, so I'll speed through this. Uh, yeah, this is me on any platform, just our Alex Stokes, and I have more writing on this stuff. Yeah, uh, we have maybe one minute for questions. Yep. <laughs> Sorry that was fast. Hey. Hey, thanks, Alex. Can you, can you uh, walk us through what would happen if um, the ETH1 state is finalized on the ETH2 beacon node, and then there's a reorg on ETH1? If the, so we, we finalize an ETH1 block? So the, a, certain, a certain ETH1 block is finalized on the beacon chain, mm -hmm. but then all of a sudden in an ETH1 world, that block is no longer right. ahead so, of the Right, so yeah, so I, I actually didn't make this clear, but part of the, the goal here is not just to like uh, have the beacon chain do this thing and like for sort of finalize block caches, but we'd actually wanna go one step further and have the proof of work chain change its actual consensus to respect the finality, um, and so, Again, I kind of ran short on time, but that's where like merging these systems like it's tricky because like you're actually changing the proof of work consensus uh, to say, okay, if a block has been finalized, we can't revert. So then it's like fork choices: go to the finalized head of the proof of work chain, then proof of work from there. Right. Um, related to this, uh, so you, you talked about how like if you have the finality gadget, you might be able to reduce the mining subsidy. One thing I don't understand about that is it feels like the mining subsidy is like most useful for the most recent blocks because you don't have like really deep reorgs and there will have to be like a delay from the beacon chain to finalize ETH1. Um, so can we actually reduce the mining subsidy significantly and, and w why is that secure? Uh, last question. So that's actually a good question. Um, I, this again, this wasn't clear from my little diagrams, but basically uh, there's effectively like, effectively like a follow distance between uh, what the beacon chain considers an ETH1 block and the actual head of the ETH1 chain. Uh, and that's actually quite big right now. The idea is like if we can deploy all this stuff and it all is happy and makes sense, then we can actually shorten that a lot. So the question is like, yeah, how, how short can we make this follow distance? It could go, I mean, theoretically just a few blocks behind the head and then it's much more clear, like, yeah, we can probably lower the subsidy. Okay, we're out of time. Thanks, everyone. I know it's early. Uh, hopefully that was helpful.